Hello, lovely humans. I'm Wyoli, and you are listening to Sex Stories, a podcast where we share intimate details about our intimate interactions in an effort to improve sex lives everywhere. And my guest today on the podcast, I am very, very excited to introduce to you, Carson Tuller. Hi. Welcome. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you. Um, Okay, for our guests who don't know you already, can you give us a little intro about who you are? Yeah. My name is Carson Tuller, and I am a 29-year-old living in Brooklyn, New York with my boyfriend. I just moved here about three months ago to live with him. I use he, him pronouns. I identify as gay. I am a wheelchair user. So we'll probably talk about this at some point, but I was in a a trampoline accident that broke my neck five, almost six years ago. So I'm quadriplegic, use a wheelchair, have most of the function in my upper body still. Mm -hmm. Some people wonder why I say I'm quadriplegic when I have use of my arms. Mm -hmm. And that's because you're quadriplegic if you have paralysis in all four limbs. So my hands are partially paralyzed. Mm. So, but other than my hands, I have most of my upper body use. Do you want some background? I would love whatever you feel is important for us to understand context about your beliefs and stories. I'm really interested to talk about your growing up Mormon. Yeah, (laughs) perfect. Because that is so much informed my process with sexuality, with yeah. my sexual orientation. Because you are the first person on this podcast who grew up Mormon. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I grew up Mormon in a military family. Oh, what so, branch? I was Air Force. Yeah, Air Force. Oh, yep. Wow. Yeah. So I moved every three years. and Active duty. Yeah. Okay. So I grew up in like nine different states. Whoa. Just from age one to... I think we eventually got to Utah where we stayed for my high school years when I was like 16. So, but up until that, yeah, moving a ton and very religious conservative family. How many siblings do you have? Five. Okay. And where do you fall in the birth order? Number two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Who's older than you? My older brother. How much older? He is three and a half years older. So what... If anything, were the conversations about sex like in your family growing up? Like, did you ever hear about it? Yeah, we did. So one of the interesting dynamics about my family is that my dad is a clinical psychologist. Mm. So we have like this conservative religious background. And I have a father who knows all about the social sciences and research and kind of like healthy practices about destigmatizing certain things. Yeah. And so there was always this interesting balance or yeah, dynamic of having a conservative background and this not so conservative background. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, I'm, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about, well, I'm wondering how much did you guys talk about feelings growing up? Because it sounds like there's, like in my family, there's kind of that conservative, sweet Midwestern vibe. And we only talked about like nice feelings and it's not like they were like hiding any deep, dark things, but sure. there just wasn't like, uh, I want to say emotional intelligence. I hope my family doesn't listen to this, <laughs> but I mean, you know, there, we didn't have, totally. we didn't have like a clear language for mm-hmm. discussing emotions growing up. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that because of my dad mm-hmm. and the way he is, and, and I think also his education, we did have pretty open conversations about emotions. Communication was always something that was encouraged. And so we talked about feelings. We were allowed to get angry. We were allowed to express a lot of love. There was a lot of, um, I have a really good relationship with everyone in my family, really healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And my dad was always, you know, physically affectionate with me in terms of hugs and kisses and a level of comfort and kind of, healthy, good affection between, you know, like a son and a father. Right. Because, you know, I mean, sometimes growing up, there was this, you know, especially as like a gay son, there was sometimes this narrative about like gay kids not having enough love Mm. from their fathers. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then they were missing that and they ended up gay because of that. And I always had this sense of like security (laughs) because 
my father yeah. was just so great with us and he never gay shamed me and I could be into anything I wanted. You know, That's amazing. Will you yeah. tell us a little bit about your relationship to coming out or if you want to tell your yeah, story about coming yeah, out or absolutely. what it was like in your family? Yeah. We didn't have a lot of conversations about gayness in my family. All I knew is that gay people existed. I knew that the LDS church, which is another name for the Mormon church, mm -hmm. the LDS church had a really strong place in the fight against same-sex marriage right when I was coming out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Yay. during Prop 8, exactly, yeah. I was actually living in California when okay. all of it happened. And about how old were you at the time? I was 13 or 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the LDS church also had a clearly written document called The Family, A Proclamation to the World about uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, and the importance of heteronormative relationships. Oh. So Mormon theology is very heterocentric mm -hmm. to achieve, and so I'm giving you this context because yep. it informs kind of the trauma around coming out mm -hmm. and not fitting into the system doctrinally. So in order to attain like the highest level of exaltation in the LDS faith, you have to be married to a member of the opposite sex mm -hmm. and sealed in a temple. And so that immediately precludes your, you know, your ability yeah. to get to heaven if you don't want to do that or if it feels disingenuous or wrong to be in a relationship oh with someone God. of the opposite sex, right? So we say you have to be, to become like God, yeah. which is the goal, to achieve your greatest potential, you have to enter into a heteronormative relationship. How did it feel to grow up hearing that over and over? I mean, I was so far in denial. Mm -hmm as a little gay kid that I just knew that that was how things had to be. Okay. And every once in a while, there was this talk about people who had tendencies, quote, yep. unquote, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, and these mm -hmm. people with tendencies were not necessarily gay. They were like straight people who had like these gay tendencies. Right. And so that allowed me to be like, oh, well, I'm one of those people who happens to be experiencing some homosexual feelings. And it's something I can totally get through and navigate so that I can still achieve my greatest spiritual potential and be like my father in heaven. <sighs> yeah. So everything growing up, especially when I hit puberty and I started falling in love with men. Yeah. And I started like actually experiencing physiological arousal toward like male anatomy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The focus of my life was diminish all of those feelings to the extent that I could mm. and overcompensate spiritually to make sure that I was always on track with God so I could survive wow. spiritually. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, it was it was an obsession and I became perfectionistic and made sure that I was excelling in everything. And especially spiritually, I just was like a zealot yeah. in a lot of ways. But I mean, like I was a really good hearted zealot. Of course. Well, yeah, yeah. Super kind and super loving and super, I mean, engaged in what I felt like was the most important kind of connection between people. Oh, I yeah. loved people and also knew that there was this one track to, to making it to heaven, essentially. Yeah. And that just couldn't include anything gay. So with that information for context, mm -hmm. how in the world did, did you then decide as a 13 or 14 year old to, to decide to come out? Yeah, um, well, so I didn't actually come out at that age. That was when you started noticing? That's only when I started noticing. Okay, okay. You know, like that super characteristic <laughs> you're like wait something's happening <laughs> response yes <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah certain 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 guy friends that i had who had matured more quickly and mm. had more stereotypically masculine features yeah like bigger muscles broader shoulders a little bit hairier <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? <laughs> right when you're like 
a uh, hairless little 13 year old yeah. like wow you're so manly and then you have these weird feelings and you're like feeling guilty but also they feel really healthy and good and yeah so yeah 13 14 was when i started to feel that i was also doing everything within my power not to masturbate at all at all is that from the church there is guidance given that we shouldn't arouse sexual feelings in ourselves or others until we're married oh. in the Mormon faith. Yeah. Even in yourself. Oh, even in yourself. Yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of disciplinary action around masturbation, that kind of becomes unclear. Right. Some of your right. leaders will say, okay, this is how we're going to proceed. Some will use some kind of like church discipline. Some won't. And that looks like taking away privileges or things like that. So that part's not unclear. It is clear that we weren't supposed to be masturbating. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. so hard. <laughs> so hard. Yeah, because, you know, all of these new feelings are budding and I'm seeing changes in myself. Yeah. And so I was doing also everything within my power to avoid masturbation, especially because anything involved with masturbation or physical arousal also included men. Of course, yeah. Naturally, yeah. as a gay person, right? Of course. As a gay man. And so I was trying to save off any, like, arousal mm -hmm. and also trying to, like, avoid any of the feelings that were, like, centered around men. And there was one time I remember looking up something on the internet and feeling super guilty. I never saw anything because I... Um, didn't I didn't know about like safe searches and I didn't right. know about right. you know <laughs> right. private browser or yes yeah. exactly all of the there, I don't know if those even existed back then like when we were that little right like, I have no idea either. I don't remember all I know is I didn't use them and didn't same. About them. same <laughs> yeah yeah so I felt so guilty and I went I went on a walk and I was like mom I have to tell you something mm. We were walking down like the dark street in California. I remember it so clearly and just feeling so much shame and said like, I am feeling attraction to men and I don't know what to do about it. And I looked something up but I didn't really see anything but I kind of wanted to. And I actually don't even remember my mom's response very well. That's incredible that you shared that with her. Do you remember how old you are? Or I, yeah, I was, so I was like 13, 14, okay. same age. Yeah. And also was sharing like, and I've been having like some feelings and sometimes like I've had, like I've touched myself or aroused that in myself and yeah. I'm so ashamed. And then like her, she, she doing the best that she could was like, well, why don't we talk to the bishop, you know, okay. and kind of figure that out. And so we went from there. I talked to the bishop. He happened to be pretty rigid okay. in terms of like, the church discipline. So I wasn't permitted to take the sacrament for like a month, which is kind of considered the path to repentance, ironically. What? Yeah. So, and, and I'm not trying to like be inconsiderate or unkind no, to people who no. still practice, you know, like all of my family members do. Yeah. You know? um, this is also stuff that like I have, Mormon friends, but don't know the intricacies of the faith. And so it's yeah. it's really interesting to hear because it provides such powerful context for reasons why people might not come out or might yes. might get into really dark places. Exactly. Especially as queer people. As queer people. Mm -hmm. yeah, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I skipped the sacrament, which was just so shaming for me Yeah. because I'm just like this little kid and I was probably in bed on my stomach rubbing my penis against the mattress or something. Yeah. Which like by something the way, super basic. Yes. And so many children discover that before they have any context for sex. The oh, more that totally. I'm talking to people, it's like, we didn't, we're just touching tingly parts, you know? Yeah, yes. It was so tingly. <laughs> <laughs> it was so tingly. <laughs> and so I felt that and then I realized, you know, it's like, well, you, you know, I mean, it's like basic classical conditioning or whatever yeah. it is. You like press a button and you get a particular feeling yeah. and then yeah. you're like, that feels great. Why would I not do that yeah. again? Yeah. So had some disciplinary action, which actually I think set the stage for just like the shame around sex. Yeah. Now it's important for me to say like not all church leaders in the Mormon faith will proceed in the same way with something around this, like I mentioned earlier. Okay. But this particular bishop did for me. 
And so then it was like, okay, I'm going to get clean <laughs> and just like not do anything wrong, not have any thoughts. And we didn't really talk about the same sex attraction part. Okay. Or the gay. Really? So it was more about touching yourself. Yeah, it was more about touching myself. And he kind of, I do remember just glossing over it barely and him saying, you know, it's not uncommon for people to have these kind of feelings Mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that you're gay or it doesn't mean anything in particular. Well, I do think he's right there. The more people I talk to, I've met so many men who privately share with me, not on the podcast, but like Mm -hmm. in messages and emails. That yeah. there is curiosity around other men, but because stigma is, and they identify as straight or at least hetero romantic. Yeah. But uh, I think the bishop's right on there. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder if he himself, he was a very gentle, mm-hmm. you know, not that we can stereotype mm-hmm. certain mm-hmm. attributes mm-hmm. or characteristics, but I would not be surprised if he himself was speaking from experience. Yeah. Let's just say that. Yeah. <laughs> and so. Then there was kind of like this stretch of maybe five or six years where I was just like doing great. And I was excelling in school. I was no longer feeling super guilty about things, mostly because I was being perfect. Wow. <laughs> and no pressure. I would, yeah, exactly. For a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> just... And um, <laughs> mostly being successful about just kind of avoiding and boxing up and the attraction of men Mm -hmm. until high school. And then I started to fall in love with some of my closest friends. Mm -hmm. And I framed that love as being like really wholesome and a spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. But it was also confusing when I had like a raging boner. Totally. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. I'm like, wow, we met before this life. And I had like a, you know, Uh raging heart on (laughs) in my pants, (laughs) trying so hard to like be good still. Yeah. Right. Like, put it into a framework that could be safe for me and made me feel like I wasn't going to hell. Yeah. Also, whenever I would have something like these feelings come up, I would immediately, like, pray hard. I would set goals. Like, okay, the last time that happened, I saw, like, I distinctly remember there was this kid in high school walking up the stairs who had incredible calves. (laughs) And I was like, whoa, like, that was super, super arousing it to really turn me on yeah. and then thinking, wow, I can't look at cabs anymore. Like oh, stuff like that, yeah. you know, like I had not looked at porn ever. Yeah. Wow. And almost never masturbated. I mean, there were a few times where I like, had slipped up. How did you um, feel when those slip ups happened? Oh, just like horrible. There's mm-hmm. so much shame, but there was less shame around the masturbation and those slip ups than for the, like the gay pieces okay. because those were the things that were just so 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 scary because they were tied to identity yeah while the masturbation was just like an action i messed up right tied to identity and also your eternal soul (laughs) yeah (laughs) just like no pressure exactly yes can i ask your friends and the people around you were most people that you experienced like good and trying to be perfect or were there other kids that were sort of like Getting frisky with each other. Oh, totally. Yeah. There was a whole spectrum. There was someone, I think that I was very much on the most extreme side of the spectrum Mm -hmm. of just goodness, goodness (laughs) and wholesomeness. Sure. And then on the other side were kids who just, you know, were kind of like normal kids Yeah. and they were doing things and they were having fun and they were getting whatever sexual experiences they wanted and they would still go to church and stuff yeah now that broke my brain when i was little like the hypocrisy of my fellow churchgoers that's why i stopped going to church because i was like we can't go to church and listen to these rules and then you were drinking and fucking on the weekend like my brain exploded and so i I was like well i don't want to be a liar so i gotta stop going to church yeah which has so much integrity for you i mean (laughs) mean, props to you i still didn't lose my virginity till i was 19 not for (laughs) lack of trying but yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was the from from what I knew, the kids my age who were slipping up and having sex mm-hmm. would go through the proper channels to correct that. Okay. And so I could just be like, oh, they're just doing their thing and you know, whatever. They're on their journey, I don't mind. Yeah. 
even though I was totally judgmental. And I was like, totally. why can't boys keep their hands off of girls? It's so easy. You know, like, <laughs> you guys are all like spineless. You have no like willpower. <laughs> like it's pretty easy. You guys are just a bunch of like. You guys can't see it, but he has his hand on his hip. It looks very sassy. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally condescending. I was like, this is so easy. Yeah, you guys are yeah. so dumb. <laughs> you know. uh, the shields of judgment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So falling in love with dudes, making goals, being like, okay, I can't look at this or that thing. I can't engage with men in this and that way, but I still you know, want to connect with them. I'm feeding myself spiritually yeah. at every turn. And so when you are a Mormon male, you are required to or expected to go on an LDS mission, mm -hmm. right? Where you go for two years and you preach the LDS gospel. You're an elder. You're an elder. Yeah. And so I had all of my life to look forward to being a missionary mm -hmm. and didn't have to worry about what was next, which was eternal marriage mm. to a woman. Right. And so there's a particular kind of a general cookie cutter sequence that not everyone goes through, but there's a general expectation. And it's graduate high school, maybe do a little bit of college or just go straight on your mission, come home, start dating um, and find a wife yeah. if you're a man. And so I didn't really have to worry about the whole gay piece of my journey until after my mission. So after uh, high school, mm -hmm, right? Because mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the mission was just this kind of suspended reality. Yeah, where One step at a time. <laughs> yeah. And I got to be, you know, I got to be with other men and I got to create intimate relationships with men. They yeah. weren't sexual, of course, but or in my case, yeah. some elders, I guess, slip up. But sure. Right. Question. You might hate this question. Yeah. How do you feel about Book of Mormon? The musical. Uh, it is so funny. I okay. have, I laughed harder than I've ever laughed in my life. I watched it in Salt Lake City. Yeah. Oh. And so it was. What was that crowd like? Oh, roaring. Oh my god. It was gosh. out of control. Oh right? my gosh. Because like oh. the, the backstage is like down the street. And what yeah. is it? Backstage, like the backdrop. Yeah. Of Salt Lake City. Yes. Yeah. No. Totally. A song called Salt Lake City. So oh it was my just, god. <laughs> And I'm sure so many ex-members of the Mormon faith were in there, right? Yeah. So, wow. but it's, it's so great. So you didn't have to worry about anything in the yes. sus suspended reality for a little bit? Yeah. And I would still have moments where I would, like, have feelings for another missionary or really connect really well mm -hmm. and want something more. Or I'd have a wet dream or, mm -hmm. like, little things like that that yeah. were out of my control. I was going to say, you cannot control a wet dream. Yes. No. No, exactly. And... So I did talk to my mission president about it. He was really reassuring. He was like, keep doing what you're doing. Like, don't beat yourself up too much and, you know, keep your promises to God and this all work out. And no so, pressure. No pressure. Yeah, yeah. And so I did. I did great. I loved my mission. I grew a lot. Where did you as go? As a human being. I went to Chile. Mm, yeah, oh, gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I loved it. Loved my experience. I came home and it was time to start dating girls. I went to what's called a singles ward, which is a church congregation of only single people. And it's where you go. That exists? Yes, it exists. And it's so that, you know, you have opportunity to date and find people and get married. Wow. And you can stay in the singles ward until you're a particular age, and then you go back to the family ward. Okay. So you can age out. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, what's the age? I can't remember. I feel I, like I would have aged out. I want, to, I want to say it's 30. <laughs> But don't I just quote me on that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I know. So it might be like thirty-five. I don't know. Yeah, let's say it's thirty-five. Thirty-five. I haven't aged yeah, out. You haven't aged out the single sword. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, was, I went to a single sword and still super in the closet, and I wasn't going on any dates with girls. Started to okay, so pornography is also has a really really heavy stigma in the mm -hmm. LDS faith, mm -hmm. which I'm like, I have a mixed feelings about porn. So do I. There's ethical porn, and then there's a bunch 100%. of real bad porn. So yeah. like again, yes, bishops maybe aren't wrong always. <laughs> you know, like they got some good wisdom. <laughs> totally, and I had seen people really close to me who had experience where they were like viewing porn without telling their spouse or mm. without disclosing that and it created huge upsets in the relationship yeah. and a sense of like being cheated on yeah. when someone was actually it's a trust violation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And so there was just a lack of transparency. And so I started to find myself 
getting closer and closer to getting into porn and mm-hmm. looking up stuff and I'd look up guys and mm-hmm. and I was like I don't want to have the same experience as these close loved ones that I've seen I think I have to face this and then wow the Mormon church came out with a website called gaysandmormons.com like it was like the LDS website for gays and Mormons or Mormons and gays excuse me and so it was all about members of the church who experienced same-sex attraction and who were still members of the church okay this was like breakthrough yeah. such a big deal I went on there and listened to a few stories and listened to guys talk about how they were best friends with girls went to school dances and never came out and were totally gay mm-hmm. and identified as same-sex attracted and mm-hmm. they used the acronym SSA mm-hmm. instead of saying gay yeah so say I experience SSA yeah or I struggle with SSA wow. was the other common phrase you know and some of these men would get into mixed orientation marriages and they would you know marry someone like a, a woman yeah a straight woman um and some of them would just remain celibate and go on their own journey right and so i found my story there and i was like this is literally me and on one hand it was it was unbelievably validating right because i was like this all fits somewhere all this whole experience has a name and a place and and a journey and a template and I mean when I say a template like right it has a name yeah <laughs> you're not and you're me. not alone yeah and it was also horrifying because it had a name yeah and so I just finally like looked myself in the mirror and I was like okay this is my experience like I I don't know if I I didn't say I'm gay right from the beginning I said you know I'm homosexual or because gay was too charged yeah. at the time still for yeah. me. Started telling, I, tell, I told my parents and I said, this isn't going away. I've been waiting for it to go away. Nothing's changing. I need to do something about it. I need to like incorporate this into my identity somehow. I can still be Mormon and still be gay. I can still be probably married to a woman and still be gay. Like that was my Whoa. goal. I was like, I will never leave my faith. And I just have to figure out where to put this and how to incorporate this. When it came time to tell them, what was, can you lay the setting for us? Yeah, it was in my living room. I sat them down on the couch and it was a pretty straightforward conversation like that. Saying, okay. I know that we we talked about this a little bit in high school. Okay. I was attracted to guys. How old were you? I was 22, Okay. probably. Mm-hmm. 21 or two and said, you know, I'm attracted to men. I thought this would go away. It's not. And I'm just figuring out what to do, but I think I actually need to deal with this instead of just like avoiding it. And so my dad expressed a great amount of love. My mom expressed a great amount of love. And that was kind of like all we knew what to do at that point. Right. Especially because I was not coming out saying, hey, I'm going to live the quote-unquote gay lifestyle, peace, to my tradition, my faith, and my background, and all of those things. I was saying, I experienced this, Mm -hmm. but I can still be part of the tribe. Wow. You know, right? Which kind of like softened the blow for all of us. Yeah. So. But still, holy cow. Yeah. And they were, I mean, they were like supportive and kind and not shaming about it in any way. Yeah. It was like reassuring. And then I went on this year journey of starting to really look at the nitty gritty of mm-hmm. like my faith and sexuality. And how did you do that? Was it like research, talking to people or just a lot of contemplation? Yeah, a lot of contemplation, a lot of journal writing mm-hmm. and a lot of just brave step after brave step of willing to say, I want that. Yeah. So it would be like, I want want to be sexually close to men i want to see men naked i want to be i want to have sex with men you know like just even saying those words and i would tell myself okay it's like not a sin if it's something that i have a desire for as long as i don't do it so Mm. then i can be authentic right to myself while not engaging in those activities and then i got to a point where i said you know what i don't want to feel like 
I'm pathologizing one part of myself right. and saying, I have SSA, right? I'm struggling right. with SSA. I want to say I'm gay because I want to be proud of like the whole package deal. I feel like that's good for my identity. And so I said, I'm going to start identifying as gay, mm -hmm. you know? And then that took a little bit for like my parents to get used to and for me to get used to. And because the word gay was always synonymous with people who were engaging yeah. in all things gay. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so I found some other people who were kind of in the same space as me. One of my best friends, actually, from my mission, mm -hmm. we came out to each other on our mission. We lived in the same house. Uh -huh. There were six elders who lived in the same apartment. And he and I would like stay up late and talked. And like mm -hmm. one night we talked about like our experience in high school and being bullied and being made fun of. And like we were both like, well. I guess we both experienced this kind of same thing mm. and it was just like not explicitly said, but then it was like, okay, we both are experiencing same sex attraction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as we put it. Wow. How did it feel to admit that to another person? And was that the first time other than talking to your mom, was that the first like yeah. family member you talked about it with? Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Or it felt, it felt safe. Yeah. Because we were both committed to the same thing. Okay. Right. Yeah. And it was like a worthy cause by church standards. Could you share where he is now in his journey? Yeah, we have actually really paralleled our journeys. Ooh. It's been amazing because we like both came home and we were both like, I was a little bit more spiritually zealous than he was. Okay. And I think that he had progressed more in his acceptance and understanding of his sexuality and that it was mm -hmm. a part of him mm -hmm. than I did because I was more like, oh, this is like a thing I deal with in a little sickness right. or something. <laughs> and he was like less in denial. Mm -hmm. And so we both got back from our missions and I was home like a little bit longer than he was just enough time for me to come out. And then he came out when he got home and we were talking to each other and it was just like the same thing of like, okay, how do we deal with this with our parents? How do we deal with this with our faith? How do we try and like disentangle these things yeah. and or not, yeah. right? Or stay true to the faith. And Every step along the way, we were both kind of like, we started to date around the same time. We started to have sexual experiences around the same time. And he has been and continues to be like just a fundamental piece of like my journey. And, um, you know, someone who's just like been there from the beginning. That's awesome. And like as an actual missionary in Chile That's with me. Amazing. Yeah. 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 It was such a gift. And that whole year I went from saying, okay, I'm going to marry a woman be faithful in the church mm -hmm. da, 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 to, to kind of saying, you know what, this just doesn't fit. I have never felt more authentic. I've never felt more good as a person, more productive, more like healthy. Did I ever say that? Like just as a human being and everything that I know about God and everything that I was taught about God says that that's how I know something's good. Yes. I, right? I believe the same thing. By, yes. I was taught by their fruits, ye shall know them. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, how can this possibly be wrong when all indicators say that this is good and of God? Yeah. And so I started experimenting and I would just like, I would go out. And when I say experimenting, I mean like teeny steps. I went on a date for the first time and I'd go back to church and be like, okay, do I sense like any loss of light? Do I feel more dark? Do I feel evil? Do I feel like I've lost my way? And then I would like continue to meet more men i would continue to embrace my sexuality and my identity and it was like the light came back on and i just could not pretend that my spiritual experience was not leading me to my best self on this like path of having sexual relationships or romantic relationships at the time right. with men were you in salt lake city at this time mm -hmm. how did you go on dates there like were you was there nervousness around public anything yeah oh yeah yeah there was i was out enough at the time that i was like okay. ready to confront okay any visibility okay um but it was like tinder essentially wow got on tinder and just like swipe i was actually with again this best friend when i like got tinder for the first time and started matching with guys and i was like oh my gosh someone swiped back like <gasps> someone also swiped <laughs> like, yeah. they were getting the hey handsome. And well, I, I was going to say, can I ask you a question about your looks? <laughs> you are so, you guys can't see them unless you're watching us on YouTube. Okay. Carson is very handsome. <laughs> you're very kind. Were you objectified a lot? Or how does, like, what are your, what's your relationship to your looks? 
Oh, man, do you mean now or then? Both. And, like, in the context of, like, being a sexual being, too. Oh, gosh. Because okay. that's, like, a huge thing. Yeah. So He's I, very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so that first year, and the reason I say that year is yeah. because I broke my neck at the end of that year. Oh, fuck. I came yeah. out and broke my neck in the same year. Holy fuck. The big reveal. <laughs> what a big year. Oh, my gosh. My entire identity in life was flipped upside down yeah and i stopped i had to kind of like put my gay journey on ice in order to recover and survive yeah. as a freshly paralyzed man uh-huh. so i'm going to answer your question so at the end of that first year i was dating someone and i was starting to get a feel for because i never identified as someone who was like like, I never felt like I was good looking. I never felt like people were interested in me sexually mm-hmm. growing up. And then at the end of that first year, I was starting to see some of, like, the interest or even just having someone swipe right yeah. as well on Tinder was, yeah. like, unbelievable to me. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my gosh, like, this handsome man also yeah. thinks I know, I'm handsome. Right? <laughs> I cannot believe this is real because yeah. I just never experienced that kind of validation growing up. I was yeah. never around other gay men. Yeah, of course. And so I or just, if you were, it was very like... Yeah, exactly. Of course, I was around other gay men. But yeah. it was just like never... <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So I was starting to feel like I was interesting. I was starting to feel that sense of, wow, like maybe I am like a viable romantic partner that others would be interested in. And that is right when I got my spinal cord injury. Whoa. Right when I broke my neck. Holy fuck. I just like halted everything. Because I was 6'5", I was putting on a lot of muscle, I was working out harder, I, because suddenly I was like in the dating game and yeah. I was like, you know what, I, for me, this is how I want to look. I was always an athlete, I was a swimmer, yep. and so I was really like enjoying my physical self. Yeah. And then I went from 6'5", and running every everywhere I went in college, and swimming, and competing even uh, to like sitting at five one in a wheelchair in a hospital the next Whoa. day. Yeah. Um, and then just like losing all of like my gains and also thinking like, how do I live my life from a wheelchair? Yeah. What just happened? Yeah. And that was like the next chapter beginning. So how did you, <laughs> how do you? <laughs> so, I broke up with my boyfriend in the hospital because I just couldn't do all the things. That's a lot of things. It was just so much, yeah. And he was the best and is the best. We're still very, very close friends, and I love him with my whole heart. He's the best, obviously. Like, his his boyfriend broke his neck. So he had a process, too. And so we ended it while I was in the hospital, and I just focused on mostly just recovery. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even think a lot about as much about the gay piece Mm -hmm. and so i just focused on my physical therapy i did extra physical therapy like i broke records in the hospital because i was like that same kind of perfectionist kid that was like wait Mm -hmm. what do i have to do to be a miracle right like what do i have to do so because i was still very uh faith driven yeah in a traditional sense during that time Mm -hmm. and so i was praying for a miracle Mm. I actually had a visit from an apostle. There are only 12 apostles in the entire LDS church, Mm -hmm. and they are in charge of, you know, ministering to the the whole world and all these countries. And one of the apostles found out that I was paralyzed in the hospital, and he came to visit me. Well, yeah. And he gave me a priesthood blessing, which is like where you invoke the power of God. Mm -hmm. And this was like, I knew this was my ticket into a miracle because like, I was like, if anyone can do this, you know, we believe that an apostle has the same power as like Peter, yeah, for example, yep. right. Who like his shadow healed people, right. Yeah. In the scriptures. And so I was like, okay, I like, this is it. I can, I, you know, and so we get in the room and he like gives me this blessing and it's beautiful and he encourages me to listen to like my by the way this is going to be relevant i promise yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, I'm, I'm with you <laughs> he says you know like follow the counsel of your therapist your physical therapist like f- 
follow God's plan, do all of these things. And if you do, like a full recovery is possible for you. And so I held on to those words for dear life. Yeah. Because I was 23. Yeah. And right, like what's at stake here is my able-bodiedness. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was a flute player. I was like headed towards being a professional musician. That was like kind of my dream at the time. Whoa. And my hands were paralyzed enough that I couldn't play anymore. I could no longer swim. I could no longer run. I could no longer do. I couldn't play the piano. Um, I haven't talked about this for a second. Mm -hmm. But I lost everything that I had used to feel valuable. Yeah. And feel worthwhile and feel um, productive in life. Like a person. Like your personhood was just like... Mm-hmm. That. Yeah. Yeah. If you write down a list of all the things that you say you are and you say, you know, who is Carson Tuller? Yeah. I would have said all of these things that I did and those things were no longer available to me. And I was so lost. Wow. Yeah. And that was like what was hanging in the balance here. And so I kind of buckled down again spiritually, but I knew that I couldn't deny all of the goodness and the beauty that came from the gayness. Mm-hmm. Like, I could not lie to myself and go back to being like, you know what, I'm just going to remain celibate. And mm-hmm. I'm going to, like, it was such a lie to myself that I was, it was like, I would rather remain paralyzed the rest of my life and be true to who I love and how I interact with human beings than have it the other way if yeah. I had to make a choice. Right. But deep down, I was like, no, I know that this is the right path for me. I know this is God's path for me. Mm-hmm. So I should get the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. I should get to have like this authentic relationship and be healed. Yeah. And so over the course of that year, my faith really unraveled because with a spinal cord injury, the trajectory of your recovery really is set in the first few months and then kind of in that first year. Oh, wow. Basically what you start to get back that first year is kind of the trend you'll see for the rest of your life. And so every day that passed that I didn't recover that I watched someone in the hospital bed next to me start moving parts and having feeling in their toes or their legs or whatever, I knew it was less and less likely that I would ever Mm -hmm. feel my body again, ever walk again, ever have what I had. And I just thought, you know, if this isn't happening and I'm doing everything exactly the way I'm supposed to, how can any of that be true? And I also just didn't, I didn't have the bandwidth during all of my grieving to also find nuance in my faith to be Mm -hmm. like, okay, you know, because at this point, I do know, I I know that there are a lot of LDS members of the church who have a very nuanced belief system and who can hold like these seemingly contradictory pieces and parts and right. Which I find incredible. Yeah. And I really respect. Me too. Absolutely. And And I think that, I I mean, I'm happy for people who can and who love to maintain their faith Mm -hmm. inside of all of that. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it. I really had to just be like, you know what? Like, I don't know who God is anymore. I don't know what I believe anymore. I don't know what's right and wrong. Part of like Mormon faith is believing there's a resurrection where you get your body back exactly the way it was created Mm -hmm. to be. And so that was also a huge like grieving point, which was like the only hope I had for recovery and like this life after death where I could walk again is now, I mean, I don't know if it's true. Right. And so what if this is my new life? Yeah. And I'm in a wheelchair for the rest of my life yeah. and paralyzed and this is just my luck and I'll die this way and it'll be over. And I, you know, grieved that yeah. deeply. And so like, My faith diminished there. And the reason I said this was all relevant is because like the change in my faith is what led me to be able to start exploring sexually Mm -hmm. as a paralyzed Mm -hmm. man Mm -hmm. in a totally new body with like men for the first time. I never had sex as an able-bodied person. Wow. Mm -hmm. Did you ever make out with your boyfriend? Your first boyfriend? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's as far as we got. (laughs) So we made out. Wow. Right? Wow. And I'm like pissed because I, I could make out now. Right. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. my God. How will you speak a little bit about what that feels like and as much as you're comfortable to the making out? 
um, or the change your body, body right now. Yeah, okay. and exploring. Here we go. Yeah, exploring. Yeah. So people with spinal cord injuries have experienced neuroplasticity, mm-hmm. where you have a change in your erogenous zones. Mm-hmm. So I lack sensation personally, mm-hmm. right, right here. Okay, so we're pointing to sternum, top chest area. Okay. Yep, yep. I have no sensation below this. Okay. I also lack sensation in half of my arms. So like the bottom half. The bottom half, like the kind of like the soft non top part. Okay. Right. So I tell people like if I was like sitting in a hole with my arms out on the surface, everything you see I can feel. Wow. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a great description. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so everything that's I can feel that. And that has become super sensitive. Mm. So as I started experimenting with guys, like I had heard, okay, your ears are going to be sensitive. Your neck's going to be sensitive. Some people's collarbones are sensitive. I realized that making out was like a whole new experience. And it was so much heightened sensation. And um, yeah, I just like started there and kind of started exploring after that. Could you share with us what some of the conversations with your partners were like around that exploration? Gosh, yeah. yeah. And if you have any advice for listeners who don't have experience or haven't done the research yet, like what, what's the best way to communicate? I mean, it's it's very personal, of course, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So maybe just share some of your experiences. Yeah, I, I, I mean, so I started kind of by like dipping my toe in the water on like Grindr or Mm -hmm. on tinder Mm -hmm. and so i would eventually be like okay so i'm in a wheelchair and you know they would ask some questions they'd be like so can you get it up Mm -hmm. can you have sex can you how do you feel about that question i mean in a sexual context it's like totally fair i I feel like it's fair (laughs) but like if you if we have like a pretty normal conversation and you're like hey that's your sexual function in the world yeah people just do that it's happened with gay men yeah Mm -hmm. But yeah, I I think that when it's asked really early in the conversation on social media. Yeah. So it's like there would be like a little bit of a flirty vibe. Yeah. But the question would come a little too early. Yeah. Is what I'll say for sure. Yep. Yep. You know, and like when we weren't even having a conversation about sex or a hookup or whatever, um, they were already saying like, well, can you get it up? Can you, can you still have sex? Okay. You know, and then I would have to like, like, yes. And a whole explanation of how things work, which I'm happy to share. Are you happy to? Great. I I would love to hear it. And I think people would benefit from hearing it. Okay, great. Yeah. So, okay. So I don't have sensation basically below my chest. I have spotty sensation through my right side, actually. Mm -hmm. A little bit of sensation in my toes. And actually, you know, through my kind of like rectal area, anus area, I still have actually quite a bit of sensation that I didn't know I had mm. initially. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not super uncommon because actually the anus is like the last thing on the spinal cord. Okay. And so they use it as like, and it, there's also like a lot of nerves around there, I mm-hmm. guess, like mm-hmm. nerve endings. And so they use it to test whether or not someone has sensation through the whole spinal cord. Okay. If you have sensation in your anus then there's something getting through the entire cord. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So I can have an erection. I'll talk about erectile function first. Okay. (laughs) So with the spinal cord injury, there are two different, well, for everyone, there's two different kinds of erections, but most men don't know that there are two different kinds because it all looks like one kind. Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. And there's psychogenic arousal. And there is like just manual arousal. Mm -hmm. So psychogenic is like you're stimulated psychologically, like you're thinking of something or you're looking at something or right. Even Mm -hmm. if like you're sitting next to someone and you're cuddling and there's that warmth and right. You get an erection. All of that is, there's a nerve for that and it's Mm -hmm. paralyzed on me. So it no longer works. Okay. That being said, so I don't experience any physiological arousal when I look at porn. Okay. So it's, essentially useless (laughs) and that's a different conversation because it's a weird experience to be like i know that's hot and attractive and great and everything i like and it's just like not hitting does it turn you on emotionally like in your feelings no okay only if there's like some kind of like romantic storyline i just have stopped watching altogether even looking at it because i'm like "Eh, yeah 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 (laughs) and so 
it's like being able to like see food and be hungry for food and you can smell food, but then you eat and you can't taste it and it never makes you fall. I'm probably going to make a reference that people are going to roll their eyes at, but if you watch the first Pirates of the Caribbean, uh-huh. Jeffrey Rush has this whole thing. I feel nothing, not the wind on my face, yeah. the touch of a woman's hand. Like that's it. That's what it reminds me of. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, that there's a certain something available, but it just yeah. never hits. So that being said, I do experience manual erectile function. So okay. with manual stimulation, like touching or pulling, right, I can get a boner. Is that fun for you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Like, like it works and it's functional. Right? Okay. And so that works. And it's also like, you know, during a intimate moment, like I know that I can instruct people to do that. Mm-hmm. And then, I, yeah, and that it works that way. And yeah. I also let them know. Then the way I'm telling you right now, I'm like, I'm not going to be having an erection while we're making out. And you should not take that as any sign of my participation or interest in this experience. Yeah. Because I'm with other men, right? Other gay men. Yeah. And they're used to seeing a boner or like an erection as the sign of, okay, we're going, this is going well. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I said, you're not going to have that for me. There also are studies in Come As You Are, they talk about non-concordance, sexual non-concordance, and like you can be aroused in your brain, and it's much more common in women to have the emotional arousal without the physical arousal. Yeah. But there is a small percentage of able-bodied men, like you know, mm-hmm. people that are fully in all their parts. What's the correct way for me to say this? Yeah, able-bodied okay. or non-disabled people. Okay. Um, in the study, it was such a tiny percentage, but there are a few of them out there. Just, Got just it. a fun fact. That's... Go read Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski. It's my favorite. <laughs> I love that. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just me communicating and yeah. saying, this is what you can expect. It's not an indication. And then I would also tell them, you know, and this is during like my experimenting phase where I would have mm-hmm. like hookups or like anonymous hookups even. Like oh. I, I got very brave and I was like, you that know That is what? very brave. Like. I am not going to let my spinal... I had some angry moments where I was like, you know, I'm not going to let my spinal cord injury keep me from getting out there and being sexually active and having these experiences. And I'm going to let people take me or leave me as I am. And so... Wow. <laughs> I Because I will say I am just now starting to do that. Just at all. Like I just started online dating I, and I'm, I find it terrifying. Yeah. Just at all. Yes. It was so terrifying. Yeah. And I was so embarrassed about the chair for a long time. Mm. Sometimes I would have to have conversations with people about like who's hosting. And I'd have to be like, oh. if you have stairs, you got to piggyback me up. Are you okay with that? Like <laughs> a stranger. Right? Wow. Now, I will, I will say that I didn't almost ever have like fully anonymous hookups where I was like totally vulnerable. Generally people that I knew because like not having... Any physical yeah, function makes me particularly vulnerable. Totally. Right? Yeah, you have to be exactly. regular. So, yeah, and I was. I was. Safety plug. If you are going to meet a stranger that you've met on a dating app, please, please, please text a friend, text three friends the address where you're going mm-hmm. and when they can expect to hear from you and just try to do the shout outs. That's perfect. No, it's so perfect. And most of these were like actually like make out hookups because those were really satisfying for me and I didn't feel like I needed to go farther. Mm-hmm. And so most of my experimenting was like social experimenting. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, how are people going to react to me now? Yeah. Well, are, are people going to be super turned off by this? By like, so, like at the time I've done, I have a device now that makes my legs, like I can exercise my legs now. Whoa. It's not voluntary. It's like electrical stimulation. Yeah. So yeah. I don't do anything. Yeah. But I have muscle mass in my legs. At the time I had really skinny, small bony legs mm-hmm. and a really bony butt. Yeah. And I was like, is this going to be a problem for people? Like I hear gay men talk about big butts all the time. Like, mm. am I not going to... Do they? What do they say about big butts? I mean, you know, like... I don't know how this could... A big butt, like, like having a big, like a fat ass is... <laughs> big muscle ass, I guess, is like the stereotype. For, okay, okay. You know, like a, a good bottom or something. Yeah, Tony I mean, hasn't talked much with butts about me explicitly. He's my best... Like, okay, okay. I just always like to know the details. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, again... Like, these are some stereotypes and also yeah. they're not necessarily it's anecdotal. healthy, yeah. <laughs> right? To say this is what a good bottom does or looks like. But just collecting the facts so we can get the full exactly. range. Yeah, yeah. And so I've heard, like, people say, like, wow, he's got amazing ass. Yeah. Like, well, if I'm bottoming, 
I don't know how this looks or yeah. feels or is, right? And I hadn't even got there at that point. Right. I was just mostly making out and kind of doing some other stuff. But um, yeah, so I started to see that it didn't deter people mm -hmm. as much as I thought it would. Mm -hmm. And I just had to be very thoughtful about accessibility. Mm -hmm. I also shared, and I'm like, sorry, I'm kind of all over the place. This is, no, this is great. I'll go back to my physiological explanation because when it came to yeah, ejaculation, yeah. yeah, I don't experience ejaculation anymore in the same way. If I have a vibrator and I can just be like a like a vibrator that a woman uses, mm -hmm. if I just like put that on my penis, mm -hmm. I can ejaculate mm -hmm. like very reliably. Cool. And it's mostly for fun. So yeah. and, and when I say for fun, it's like I don't experience the same physiological sensation right. of orgasm along with an ejaculation anymore. It's okay. pretty like clinical. Okay. I have like my blood pressure goes up. I kind of get flushed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it feels like generally good, mm -hmm. but it's not an orgasm. Okay. So I would tell them that. Okay. And then I would tell them I'm going to climax via my neck and my ears, most mm -hmm. likely. And so just so you know, that's where like the goods are and where things need to happen. You are the first male-bodied person who has shared with me orgasms via neck and ear stories. Perfect. That's really stupid, but like, yeah. Yeah. Because I've heard many stories of female-bodied people who can climax from this region. Yes. And you were the first male-bodied person yeah. to share that. Okay. I will tell you that when I hear about female-bodied individuals talk about orgasm, mm -hmm. it sounds so much like what I experience now. Like, so, so, so similar. I don't know if it is, but yeah. we, we can't know. We, right. we will never actually know, like, in the same way that I will never know what it's like for another female-bodied person to actually have an orgasm. Or, like, are we saying, like, that's green? Is it really green? Do we see totally. the same? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, totally. So what I've realized about my sexual function is, and I would kind of tell them this to varying degrees depending on their, like, receptivity mm -hmm. and whether or not I felt like I really needed to. Yeah, because some people were a lot more intuitive, and some people were really willing to like totally explore non unconventional ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I'll experience like arousal through like touching or mm -hmm. kissing or nuzzling or mm -hmm. anything around my neck, and then it all gets so 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 much more intense around my ears, mm -hmm. and it's like a slow climb. Okay, it's a pretty slow build, and having had normal orgasms before, it's just not quite the same. Okay. As when I would like ejaculate. You is know? it possible? I ask people this question a lot. And it may not be possible. Is it possible to articulate the actual bodily feeling? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It feels like there's like sunshine in my veins. <gasps> <laughs> wow. Okay. So it's wow. like, but it will like be varying degrees. So at first, like I'll start to feel it actually in like my legs, which the only thing I feel in my legs like 90% of the time is, is pain. I have like nerve pain oh. from my spinal cord injury. Like just on the regular, like uh, right now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, right now. So it's Fuck. just like, uh, like it's like a four out of 10 of just like this constant kind of like little burn, simmering needles, pins and needles feeling. Okay. Yeah. And I've just like learned that that's going to be a part of my life. And it doesn't okay. distract me enough that I don't, you know what I mean? I can like live my life around I it. personally don't. Mm -hmm. And holy fuck. Wow. Yeah. And I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and that's why feeling in my legs something mm -hmm. different is just mm -hmm. like the best. Yeah. So. Yeah, replace it with sunshine <laughs> or just add some sunshine. <laughs> yeah, so it will be like gradual and it'll start being like more intense. Yeah. And more intense and more intense. And it can get, it'll get to a point where it's kind of like, <sighs> the way I would explain it is like, it's, it's, so close to this like line of it's like euphoria and this sense of like unbearableness mm -hmm. that's almost it's not painful but it's like i sometimes like involuntarily like recoil or pull mm -hmm. away when mm -hmm. it gets too sensitive mm -hmm. or i'm like i need like 10 seconds and then i we have, can go back yeah yeah, yeah. but eventually it'll get to a place where like my whole body is just kind of like feels like it's glowing wow. yeah and the best thing about my spinal cord injury is that I can hold on to that kind of climax for as long as I can bear it. It will not peak ever. And so... Okay, the uh, question everyone's going to want to know is like, what's the longest have you ever timed it? 
Yeah, I've never, that's I've a never boring question, but that is amazing. The, 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 line, the, the line of when I reach it is kind of blurred a little sure. bit, right? Sure, good point. Oh, um, my gosh. But I can, like, stay there for, like, 15 minutes and just, like, sit do, there. With the stimulation? Like, yeah, do you, and you're communicating with the partner? Totally. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. do you communicate about that? Like, do you say keep going? Or you, yeah, I'll okay. say keep going or I'll say... I need you to take your hand or your mm-hmm. finger, like fingernails, mm-hmm. and just like put it right here, mm-hmm. like on my head. Okay. Cool. Like just add some stimulation, That's or sometimes amazing. like I need like a little bit of something like more, like uh, abrasive. Yeah. Like beard or yeah. a little bit of uh, something happens to my scalp, so like I'll I'll be getting. Okay, so for the record, like I currently have a boyfriend, mm-hmm. and we're in a monogamous close relationship, mm-hmm. and so the only time I'm experiencing like this is with him. Yeah. And he is so proficient. He sounds and awesome. Perfect <laughs> at all of this more than I've ever experienced in my whole life. Right. Mm. It's just like perfect. Yeah. And so I, I feel very, very fortunate. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we've also learned together. Right. But so cool. what I do need is like, we get closer and closer is like having the fingernails, like go up my scalp yeah. while I'm getting my ears stimulated or worked on or whatever is what will like take it to the the top and then we'll just like stay there for as long as i can and it sounds stupid but like sometimes i like get this sudden urge to like cry yes no very often that makes total sense to me because it's a it's a physical release and you're also doing so much building and i just have to say this level of specific communication is something that it's the reason this podcast exists because I, my entire life, I'm sort of like, okay, I don't have the language tools. I'm still becoming more mindful about what's actually happening in my physical body. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. trying to put that into words that I can understand for myself and then trying to actually say them out loud to another person Mm -hmm. in the moment is something I still struggle with Yes, in a huge way. Yeah. And I realized early on that if I was going to enjoy my experience with sexuality, that I had to be very directive. How did you learn how to be very directive? Or did you just I do just it? knew because okay. I wasn't getting okay. any pleasure. Yeah. You know, so like I would, I just had more interest in me as a top, mm-hmm. let's mm-hmm. say, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so I would, I don't have sensation. I don't have a lot. Of, I've discovered more sensation through my penis. Mm-hmm. Through like, yeah, that whole area, right? Mm-hmm. And but at the time, not so much. Okay. And so like, we would have sex, and he would, I would top, and then we'd be done. And I was like, ah, I didn't really feel a ton, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, I need to start saying like, hey, I would like for this to be like a mutually enjoyable experience, and for me, that means that I need some time on my neck and ears. Yeah. And I know that's probably atypical. And not going to make sense, but like we can totally enjoy the traditional kind of sex. And I need this added because yeah. I really want to leave feeling fulfilled. Good for you. Yeah. Fuck yeah. I also just want everyone in the world to be able to say that and to be able to like communicate it with partners and yes. then the how, because I think there are many of us that can't or don't, or I know mm-hmm. I still experience shame. And particularly since having this podcast, I, you know, I broke up with a partner of two years mm-hmm. in June for good. Mm-hmm. And, and that was such a huge experience for me in in terms of like growth and learning about myself and being able to communicate explicitly and it's opened up so much for me yeah and so as i started dating again i have i'm wrapped up in shame every time i can't communicate something or don't or i'm not able to figure it out and so then so that is so deeply inspiring to me yeah yeah no i'm so glad and i have a belief about disability in sex Mm -hmm. and it is that disability and understanding and learning about like disabled sex Mm -hmm. is so informative to able-bodied sex because things don't always work in this stereotypical way. Yes. You can't, you know, say A plus B equals C anymore. No. And so I learned that I had to come into this saying, this is how things generally work for me. I don't know if it's going to be the same every time, yeah. but 
are you comfortable with me vocalizing to you what works and doesn't work? I would just like bring that from the oh, very that beginning. That is amazing. That is such a good script to practice and, too. And then I don't even have to worry about it in the zone because I've already said, hey, yeah, is it okay? Can we like communicate through this? Yeah. And if a person wanted like a get in, get off, get out experience, then I'm not the one to have that with. No. Nor do I want that. I also think those are boring in general. They're so boring. I think it's so boring. Yeah. And I want so more. Boring. Yeah. Because we can have physical pleasure, but it's like, it's even if you never see that person again, I believe it's more interesting when you're actually like connected to the person being like, this thing, this thing, this thing, what about that? And yes. then you're exploring and discovering. And I also, my experience with men, and I'm making a generalization, but my experience is they don't touch me enough. Like mm -hmm. I, I have a large capacity to be touched, but it's like, not even just in private parts, like just in general. Yes. And I think that's such a missed opportunity because I think humans love skin to skin contact mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. So I am on board with this yeah. mission. Yeah. Me and my current boyfriend have a rule that is you get to ask for anything you want. You can mm. make any request and then it falls on the other person to um, meet the request or not. And yeah. nothing is taken personally. That's beautiful. But you get to ask for anything you want. And I just always take them up. I'm like, will you just lay on top of me? I love Or that. like, will, <gasps> will you just touch me in this or that way? Or will you put your leg between mine? Or will you, like, exactly explicitly what I need? Or what? That's amazing. Yeah. I, something I discovered recently about myself is, so I identify as submissive, kinky. I also <laughs> enjoy vanilla sex. Like, I love <laughs> touches of all kinds. Yeah. Um, by most people if it's consensual but that includes like if a stranger on the street is like can i pet your head i'm like please you <laughs> I know the same way. And, that's, and so it's like, totally. like don't don't cross my back like ask yes but then i'm probably going to say yes because i love being touched yes and so i have a problem asking for what i want because what gets stuck in my brain i start to loop on they're only doing this because i asked they don't enjoy this oh my god and then yeah. i devolve into an anxiety spiral mm -hmm. which then like as i'm devolving into that anxiety spiral i feel shame about it so it's like totally. these meta judgments yeah, yeah. but that's such a good clear frame that to me sounds full of joy and exploration and like mutual connection yes. and fun it's playful like it's yes. play to yes. lay on your partner sounds so fun <laughs> just like i need all the body weight please yeah i yeah no no it's exactly what you said and at first i wanted my partner and even like my current boyfriend to just like be this quote unquote perfect match mm. like what he wants is what i want and what, oh my god i'm that person too works I'm like, can we be exactly the same yes. or compatible perfect yes yes, yes, yes yes so like i love nipples <laughs> mm. i have i i do i love them i love playing with them like in terms of like intimately yeah. and that whole thing and i've yeah. learned that if they're not into it and it doesn't come naturally that it's okay for me to still ask for it. Yeah. And I have decided to frame it as like a greater expression of connection and or love, depending on the situation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When someone is willing to meet a request yeah. because you asked for it. Yeah. And so I have decided that that is incredibly meaningful rather than thinking, oh, they, if, if they don't do it naturally, then it's disingenuous. That is such a good point and rings so true for me based on my own personal experience because I think about everything I explored with my ex-master. It was all very brand new to me. Mm -hmm. And listeners have heard me talk about anal sex a lot for myself. It took me nine months to get to an ascasm. And so it was just this thing where I was like, oh, no, nothing. But I was so deeply aroused because he was aroused yeah. and so it was this responsive desire that grew into my own preference now that mm -hmm. i can take yeah. with me yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah it's totally. like the the flexible nature of our sexual beings is mm -hmm. and the discovery of that i think is yeah. glorious no it's exa exactly right and there are other things that i'm willing to do or participate in that aren't generally the thing that i think is the sexiest mm -hmm. and so you know like like a massage mm -hmm could be considered more like cuddly, less sexy, but you know, sometimes that's the request. Yeah. And so it's like, that doesn't land for me in the same way. And if it lands for you that way, I'm totally in this to, to take you where you need to be. Like, Amazing. you know, like sexually in, in terms of like pleasure. Right. If in a hypothetical situation, we were to collaborate, my day job is a photographer. I am a photographer yeah. by, by day. 
if we were to collaborate on a persons with disabilities sexy calendar, mm -hmm. would you want to be in it? What month would you want to be? And what organization would you want proceeds to go to? Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> not not necessarily fully nude, just like sensual, like very, you know. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Because that's on my bucket list. <laughs> Is it? Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> Anyone who follows my Instagram knows that I have this kind of openness about my body. Yeah. And I have some things that are semi-nude on there. Yes, it's much easier for men to be shirtless. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, totally. And I'm sure it's like a my hips. Oh, yeah. Part of that, um, but yeah, definitely, I have a lot of shirtlessness on there. <laughs> or like in my stories, I, oh, I have some stuff in underwear because I value that, and I yeah. really value elevating the sexual experience of people with disabilities. Yes, like the conversation around disability and sex is that like disabled people don't have sex, or that they don't have sex in the same way, or it's not as you know meaningful. Yeah, and I had to combat that, and so I'm so interested in being a part of that conversation. It's why I wanted to be on this podcast. Yeah. It's why I will absolutely do a photo shoot. What with month you would you want to be? In sept for September. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. Yeah. I think September would be great. And maybe the Christopher Reeve Foundation mm -hmm. for spinal cord injury. Great. Would be a great place for the proceeds to go. And I want to change the conversation around um, disability that we're having nationally at least yes. or globally. And yeah. I had so many moments when I was exploring mm -hmm. and when I had to communicate and when someone had to be vulnerable with me and not just do the A plus B equals C right. version, right? But I had to do like Q plus K equals Y or something. Yes. <laughs> and it was such a new experience for them. I had so many people tell me that it was the most fulfilling or the most or the sexiest. And I'm not... I'm, trying to brag or anything no, no, but no. like the feedback was this was one of the best sexual experiences i've had wow um and i attribute that to the way that we were forced to communicate yes. if i was going to participate it sounds if i'm hearing correctly it sounds like it has to include vulnerability has on to. both sides it has to yeah. yeah and i get that that's not always safe for some people because they that. just yeah. want to have something that's predictable. They don't want to connect emotionally, and that's fine. Yeah. But for me, you know, it required me getting vulnerable, and it also required them saying, like this, yeah. like this, does that yeah. work? Is that right? Uh, what else? You know? Yeah. And, and I'd say, okay, and do more direction. And then like, oh, yes, that's perfect. Okay, just like stay there. Or, Did you ever have partners get upset when you were redirecting, or was it pretty open and clear? No. Okay. Yeah, it was always, but I, again, I almost always set the stage so that yeah. there was never Beautiful. a surprise moment. I was just like, I'm going to need to probably direct you so because it's not always predictable for me. Yeah. Like what happened last time might not happen this time. But that's how it is with all sex. Yeah, I think Do you're you know right. I mean? Yeah, it is, it, it is totally unpredictable. I know that I'm in the habit of uh, like feeling shame when I'm not the normal thing. And so I don't yeah. always communicate about it. And so that is literally what I'm trying to change because yeah. I do believe we will all have better lives and live in a better world if we are sexually fulfilled. Yes. I, I genuinely believe that. Yes, me if too. We can, if me we too. can un a... unlock the shame. Yeah, it's a spiritual part of my journey for sure. Mm -hmm. And... I think that what I want people to know, based off my experience, right, if I could, like, shake it, like, the world and be like, listen to me about sex. <laughs> yeah. Yes, like, please. So what go. I want to say is, is that um, sex can look like a million things. And it doesn't always include the parts you think it will include. It can include none of the parts you think it will include. It can include things that don't seem sexual. And it, it just can't take this predictable form. And spinal cord injury forced me to learn that. Yeah. And it has forced my partners to learn that. But I think that our experience is so much more enriched because exploration and discovery mean you can always win. You know? Yes. There's not, there's not a goal. Yes. If there's a goal, oh you God. just can't yes. discover in the same way. Yes. You know? Yes. If you hit climax and if there's ejaculation and orgasm or if there's whatever, awesome. 
And if there's not, it can still be the most fulfilling, the most mind blowing or the most meaningful sexual experience. Yeah. You know, beautiful. I, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> what hopes do you have for your sexual self going forward? Hmm. <sighs> I, lo- I mean, I, I like to explore so much. Mm-hmm. I like a lot of variation. And so I continue to learn with my boyfriend about new things that work. I want to explore more. I recently discovered a little bit more sensation in, like, my junk, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, here's a good one. I really really am working on trying new positions cool. where I can actively top. Like, okay, so listen, I don't have any abdominal strength. Right. I have no back strength. I have no hip strength. Like, I cannot thrust from my hips where it originates in my hips. Right. But I am in the process. <laughs> and this is tricky because it's like holding a plank. Like as long yeah. as you can hold a plank, you can try this. And so after like a minute, I'm like, I, we have to do this another time. I can't hold myself yeah. up anymore. Yeah. But trying new positions where I can like actively talk yeah. has been so fun. That's and awesome. And so empowering. And I, I feel like, I feel like. That's awesome. Just like a rock star. You know, so like, th- so it's like doing that more, perfecting it. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> it's just, it's, it takes like just the right angles in terms of like where I place my paralyzed body because I have to kind of anchor points. Yep. Right? Totally. Yeah. And so it's kind of like this balance game where I can maximize the function of my shoulders and arms in terms of pulling myself in or pushing away. Yeah, so so that's on the list. And then I have more to explore in terms of sensation as a bottom, for sure. Cool. And around that area, because I think there's some untapped uh, possibilities cool. and potential through there, for sure. Can I ask you a sex question that's related to Mormonism? Yeah. And just tell me if it's very offensive. <laughs> okay. So I grew up with a few Mormon friends, and they would always tell me about <clears throat> soaking which they explained to me as something that happens in the Mormon church where people are like putting it in, but as long as there's no thrusting or like, and then they stay inside the woman Uh until the man either becomes flaccid or just ejaculates. But the key is there's no thrusting. Have you ever heard of that? Because I am strangely aroused by it and have asked past boyfriends to do it with me. And I just find it like a hilarious sensation is that a thing? I actually don't know, and it's okay. possible because I just didn't participate in the heteronormative okay. community. Of, like, fair, you know fair. What I mean? So no, okay. I don't know <laughs> about Because I always was like, I think they're lying to me, and I just don't know. Like, no, no, I, it's very possible. So there are like <laughs> variations of that kind of thing where, you, you know, in order to remain within the bounds of certain commandments mm-hmm. that you can get very very close to sex without sex okay. or like you can almost like like if you just don't climax then you right. don't have to quite be accountable for like the whole thing <laughs> okay and so there's a lot of like line playing we, yeah we that. find our great areas. <laughs> yes is there anything else you want to say about your sexual self oh, or just anything in general Yeah, I I think that I would just say that I still continue to, you know, this podcast started, I mean, this episode, me talking with so much about like my faith and so much about shame. Mm -hmm. And I still navigate that Mm -hmm. and constantly push back against that, right? Like, especially as a disabled person, I have what people sometimes consider to be an inspiring presence on social media Mm -hmm. or people with disabilities can be, Yeah, like used as inspiration porn. Mm -hmm. And our sexual identities are forgotten. Yeah. And so sometimes I still feel shame about that. You know, I still still feel shame about showing up as a sexual being. Mm -hmm. Because I think, oh, well, maybe this is incongruent with what people expect of me. Maybe it's incongruent with, like, what I grew up with. Like, needing to be this wholesome individual that just didn't experience gayness or gay sexuality. Mm -hmm. and. So it's, it's still so much a process for me. 
And I'm still committed to integrating that piece into my life in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Even like as a professional moving forward, I have felt shame for so many different pieces of myself for so long Mm -hmm. that I don't want to put any other piece of myself in the closet Mm -hmm. because of shame. And so I'm committed to continuing kind of the conversation about sexualizing disabled people in a good, healthy way. Beautiful. You know, yeah. So. And lastly, if you could go back in time and give younger you a piece of sexual advice, what would you say and what age would you pick? Oh, man. But they're going to be, he's going to be in the same space, right? In terms of like. You can answer it different, multiple ways if you, okay. if you like. Okay. Yeah. One way I would answer it is I'd love to go back in time and kind of just like put my brain back in young Carson's brain and yeah. be like, look, it's all good. Like you can have boy crushes, you can have a boyfriend, you can experience all of these things as like a healthy young person. Do it now. Yeah. Like like have that experience, live, spend your time developing yourself as a human being in that way instead of in fear and in regret and in shame. So I, I would do that. Mm-hmm. But knowing that I could never have gotten through to myself right. in that way, I would say. I'm taking this question very literally. No, that, no that's great. <laughs> I, and I think all answers are valid, and I think multiple answers are great, too. Yeah. I would also say to, to just like be gentle. Mm-hmm. Be gentle with yourself and the guilt and the shame and... None of this is as grave or matters in the way you think it does. And so while you figure things out, don't beat yourself up too much. Be gentle with yourself. Forgive yourself. Beautiful. Yeah. Where can people find you on the internet? Okay. People can find me on... I'm mostly on Instagram Mm -hmm. with Carson, C-A-R-S-O-N, underscore. And then my last name, Tuller, which is T-U-E-L-L-E-R. And Sex Stories Pod and my account, follow him, so you can go find him there, too, if you have a hard time with spelling. Oh, so, yeah. And then same, for, same um, on Twitter and Great. Facebook. It's just my name. So. Yeah. And he's, he writes beautiful posts, so go check him out. Mm, thank you. Folks, that's our show for this week. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of this with us. This is amazing. Yeah. No, it's my pleasure. Amazing. Thank you. As always, you can find us on Instagram at Sex Stories Pod or my personal is at YOV. You can visit sexstoriespodcast.com if you want to write me a message uh, or send me a sex story. And go rate us on iTunes if you haven't already. Five stars helps other people find us if you write a comment. That's even better. So big love to each and every one of you. Please, please, please go out and share a sex story.